Uh, we're here today for Saving Financial Aid, uh, Expanding educa Educational Opportunity, and Reimagining the Way We Pay for College by Promoting Children's Savings. Um, I'm Justin King. I work in the Asset Building Program here. Our director, Reed Kramer, wanted very much to be here today, but was unable to. He sends his regards to all of our participants and all of our guests. As I'm sure most of you know, uh, we in the Asset Building Program are committed to exploring how uh, public policy can create pathways to greater economic opportunity, mobility, and long-term social development. One of the ideas that we've been focused on for a number of years is exploring the potential role that savings can play in orienting children towards the future. The idea that having an account in their own name can trigger behavioral change that can get kids on the road to pursuing higher education and greater outcomes for themselves than would otherwise have been possible. If it's true that there's a link between participating in a savings process and educational outcomes, then this is very clearly a powerful lever that policymakers need to care about. Uh, this could serve as a means to achieve our national goals uh, for boosting post-secondary education, uh, but also furthering America's larger long-term economic goals. Uh, there's many facets to understanding that relationship. Uh, there's a need for a clear theory on how those triggers might work, there's a need for policy pilots and demonstrations. And there's a need for research to understand what happens in the real world. And, and I'm happy to say that, that a lot of that uh, uh, work is underway. Uh, we've explored the potential of children's savings accounts, and we've benefited from collaboration with a number of excellent partners. Uh, and we're really pleased that today is, is an example of that collaboration uh, with the Assets and Education Initiative at the University of Kansas, which is led by our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Willie Elliott. Uh, Willie has been a fellow with us in the Asset Building Program when he was at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he set up his own shop out in Kansas now and is a real leader in this work. Uh, today, uh, Willie and the Assets and Education Initiative are releasing a new report, Building Expectations, Delivering Results, Asset-Based Financial Aid, and the Future of Higher Education. This report really brings together evidence of the theories that underlie the relationship between assets and educational outcomes, and highlights some of the ways in which an asset approach to college finance uh, may deliver superior educational outcomes as compared to our current overwhelming reliance on student borrowing and debt. Uh, this work and other resources can be found on their new and excellent website. It's savefored.com with the number four. Um, and as I understand it, the entire transcript, uh, manuscript of the report can be uh, downloaded on the website. Uh, conveniently, uh, save for ed with the number four is also the Twitter hashtag uh, for conversing about today's event online. And uh, future conversations will use that hashtag as well for those so inclined to participate that way. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the funders of the report for their, for their support. Uh, Rosemary Burns from City Foundation. Zakia Smith from Lumina, uh, Benita Melton from Mott, and Kilolo Kijikazi from the Ford Foundation. Um, I think it's really important to note that, that those individuals are not just financial supporters, but they're thought partners. Um, they're committed to exploring the potential of ideas that can make an, a difference in children's lives. Um, and, and their work uh, in this area, I think, is going to lead us to, uh, uh, to great things in combination with all of the partners in this field. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today, as well as um, uh, those in the room and those online. Uh, and I'm going to take a moment and turn it over to Rosemary Burns from City, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the report. Uh, Rosemary, please join me. Thank you, Justin, and good morning, everyone. I've never been one of those speakers to say, I have a cold today, so bear with me. But today I have a really bad cold, so I want you to bear with me because at any moment I might grab the bottle. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here um, on behalf of the City Foundation talking about a topic that we believe in very deeply. And we're looking forward to a thought-provoking discussion um, with our panelists as we discuss the catalytic role that college savings accounts can play in improving college completion rates in our country. A little bit about the City Foundation. Our mission is to support the economic empowerment and financial inclusion of low and moderate income people in communities where a city operates. Here in the United States, that work in our education portfolio focuses solely on college success. 
and supports programs that dramatically inc increase the number of low and moderate students who are obtaining a college degree and bringing their families into the financial mainstream and breaking the cycle of poverty. We support programs that are assisting students through the search application financial aid process and provide them with and their families with access to college savings tools. And we're working closely with our community partners to evaluate what the financial barriers are to college completion and how they can be overcome through very targeted interventions that can then be measured. Through our more than philanthropy approach, we're putting the strength of city's business behind our philanthropic investments so that we can help improve communities. We all know that college costs have far exceeded growth and in family income, and too many families are struggling with trying to determine how and when they will send their young people to college. Um, the complexity of fi filling out the financial aid form, um, those are the two biggest stumbling blocks that students and their families are facing. And studies like the one we're going to hear about today clearly show that savings reinforces the aspirations of low income and first generation students going to and completing college. And that's why City Foundation is proud to have invested over $40 million um, in the last eight years, as well as leveraging our role as a financial institution to bring pioneering college savings to life. And I just want to share a little example with you of the work that we're doing in this space, um, where we're relying heavily on the research to confirm and support us in this work. Working with the KIPP College Account Program, we have taken a collaborative that includes five KIPP regions across the nation, UNCF, the United Negro College Fund, um, who are, are known to be great providers of scholarship, and the guidance and wisdom and the work that has already been done by the trailblazing efforts of the Corporation for Enterprise Development, CFED. We've created a college savings program that's an innovative partnership that's mitigating the non-academic issues that students are facing in these schools that are helping them get to and through college and really determining and changing the way that their families are looking at not if I go to college but when I go to college because the aspiration has changed. So we're building on the academic rigor and character development that the KIPP schools are so well known for and do a terrific job with and we're offering incentivized college savings accounts working with our business unit within City Microfinance to build out a product that's allowing us to make these accounts possible so that students can begin to make deposits, open the accounts, make deposits, and continue to engage their families in financial education and savings mobilization so that when they are ready to make that choice as to where they go to college, they have that pool of money that we know isn't going to get them into college or pay for the whole thing, but it is certainly making a transformational change in the way that those students are seeing their future and believing that they have the opportunity to go and, and, and complete college. And that's really the work that we're so proud of. The program is a pilot. It's now in its third year with, with over 1,300 students actively participating. They've accrued close to $1 million in both their own deposits as well as incentivized matches that are in place to support them. Um, and they continue to show promise that they will reach their savings goals so that those matching funds can be made available to them, which will significantly transform their college readiness and success measures. So demonstrations like the one I just mentioned are critical because they prove that what we learn through research really can happen. And the work that we're going to talk about today that Dr. Elliott, um, who I am proud to call my phone friend and really thrilled to actually finally be um, here today to uh, meet him in person. We've worked very hard on this initiative. Um, he's done a terrific job of moving the research forward um, through the work of the Assets in Education Initiative at the University of Kansas School of Social Welfare. Um, so with that, I am very pleased to open up the conversation um, that Willie Elliott and Melinda Lewis are going to lead us in. So thank you very much all for being here. I have to say a quick story building off of Justin's story. We were all sitting in the, in the uh, 
meeting room, and all of a sudden, like Spider-Man, the uh, water wa water guy came hit the window. Maybe that's the same time that you got splashed when you hit the window there. But it was it was fun. So I want to thank uh, New America Foundation and everyone else here for coming today uh, and for all your support and help along the way, not just today, but throughout my career and my work in this area. They've always been good partners. CFED is here as well. I'm really happy to see you in a room. Um, all the funders, uh, City, uh, Lumina, Ford, Mott, we thank you again for your support. So today we're, today we're going to talk about the biannual report. Uh, the biannual report on the assets education field Building Expectations, Delivering Results, synthesizes a wide body of research on children's savings accounts, CSAs, potential to transform the way that students pay and prepare for college, and in turn, may help to restore the promise of the American dream. Student loans are everywhere in today's political dialogue, including here in Washington, D.C., but the scope of conversation, mostly limited to discussion of interest rates and repayment terms, misses the most important question when it comes to the student loan program. Is America getting its money's worth? Examining the cost in light of outcomes, it is clear that we could do better. While student borrowing rises, graduation rates remain flat. High costs serve as enrollment deterrents for many talented low-income and minority students, depriving them of economic mobility in the nation of their contributions. There is reason to believe that the higher education problems we lament can be traced, at least to a considerable degree, to over-reliance on student borrowing as a way to pay for college. We have collectively failed to imagine how we could structure opportunities for low-income and other disadvantaged students to create levers for meaningful college access and equitable returns on their education investments. Research discussed in Building Expectations Delivering Results suggests that Debt over $10,000 may depress graduation rates and harm post-college financial security. With an average debt now in excess of $26,000, college graduates may delay investments in wealth-building assets such as buying a home. Furthermore, student loans do nothing to address what, might be, what may be our most serious educational challenge, starting early to academically prepare students to succeed. As a nation, we can't significantly increase college completion rates essential to global competitiveness by relying disproportionately on borrowing. We need a financial aid system equipped to deliver excellent outcomes in the postmodern world. Unfortunately, none of the proposals for fixing financial aid, forgiving loans, lowering interest rates, increasing tax credits, or tu tuition guarantees focus on the one lever that simultaneously improves college affordability, readiness, completion, and financial health in adulthood, children's financial assets. CSAs are evidence-based vehicles for improving students' outcomes prior to, during, and after college. In Building Expectations Delivering Results, we suggest that if debt over $10,000 depresses graduation rates and harms post-college financial security, and the average amount of debt children have upon graduating is about $26,000, children need to save about $16,000 in order for asset holdings to allow the student, student loan program to have an optimal effect. In practical terms, this means that assuming no initial deposit, a one-to-one -one match on contributions, and a 5% interest, families would need to save about $23 per month, starting at birth to achieve $16,000 in savings by the time a child reaches 18. When we think about it in these terms, it seems doable, particularly when we think about the possibility of government and third-party contributions as well. When we consider the potential for improved educational engagement and achievement, it seems imperative. Certainly, in the public part of this collective investment could fit within the fiscal footprint of our current financial aid commitment, even while delivering the potential for significantly improved outcomes. This suggests that national implementation of CSAs need not be costly for children, their families, or the government. Moreover, evidence presented in Building Expectations Delivering Results shows that even having a few hundred dollars in savings designated for education is significantly associated with a child's educational outcomes. Low-income and moderate-income students with less than $500 designated for college are three times more likely to enroll and four times more likely to graduate from college. Understanding how and why assets affect student achievement is key to building the political will to create CSA structures capable of delivering these educational outcomes. Here, Building Expectations Delivering Results can serve as a catalyst in the field. CSAs build on, the, on an over a decade of research showing that for students to achieve 
their potential, institutions around them need to support their use of effort and ability in school, what we call institutional facilitation. Institutional facilitation is built on the realization that in a highly specialized and technical society like we live in today, institutions augment our use of effort and ability in ways that create artificial winners and losers. Steve Jobs puts it this way, humans are tool builders and we build tools that can dramatically amplify our innate human abilities. He went on to tell a story that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The story went something like this. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer, and humans came in with a rather unimpressive showing, about a third of the way down the list. But then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a human on a bicycle. And a human on a bicycle blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. He then said, of me, he then said for me, the personal computer is the bicycle of the mind. Building on this story, in 2013, a student who enters my classroom and does not have access to a computer in the latest software is at a distinct disadvantage. It will take her longer to look up related articles. She will be more likely to have grammatical errors. She will have less time for proofreading and so on. If she's in my stats class, she will spend hours hand calculating what computers can do in mere seconds. This doesn't mean that the student without a computer could not be the best student in class. It does mean, however, that the student will, would have to work much harder and have much more ability. Which none of, <clears throat> in this way, access to institutional resources can create artificial winners and losers, which none of us like. Of course, when we're talking about students whose aspirations tend to attend college after high school graduation will before they make it to enrollment, or students whose likelihood of college graduation uh, is compromised by the strains and that accompany high dollar debt, the stakes are considerably higher than the locomotion of condors in humans. As an example specific to college loans, a student who goes to college and graduates with the higher amounts of student debt has to work much harder to reach the same level of wealth accumulation as a student who graduates from college but does not have student loans. Ellie and Nam find that living in a household with a four-year college graduate with outstanding student debt is associated with having about $186,000 less in net worth compared to living in a household with a four-year college graduate without student debt. Yes, the child who graduates with student loans is better off than she would be if she did not graduate. Research on economic mobility is clear that a college degree is still a conduit to greater financial security. But this does not change the fact that effort and ability do not lead to similar outcomes in a world where institutions, some present, others left over some times past, artificially make winners and losers. Building expectations delivering results suggest that in a postmodern world of today, what one can do, whether one group is successful or not, can only be understood within the context of institutions and the resources they provide. The right to own individual financial assets provides people with the capacity to, to participate in, negotiate with, influence, control, and hold accountable institutions that affect their lives. When we provide children with individual assets, we are essentially providing them with the power to access and command societal resources needed to reach the American dream, as well as their full capacity as tool builders for the next generation. The opposite would also have to be true, of course. When we do not provide children with access to individual assets, we are essentially denying them command over social, societal resources they need to reach the American dream in their full capacity. When children do not reach their full capacity, they not only lose, but we also lose. The underlying message in building expectations delivering results is that low-income and minority students are disadvantaged, not because of innate capacity limitations or lower aspirations, but because they often encounter institutions that do not or cannot provide them with the financial resources they need. Don't be mistaken. Asset approaches are not entirely absent from college financing. Wealthy students currently benefit from their parents' ability to signal early and often that college is likely, and significant tax advantages augment these families' capacities for building wealth to spend on their children's education. This results in an asset advantage for these students. The institutions in these children's lives, their parents, financial institutions, other, often their schools, augment their efforts and ability and send a message that college is part of their futures. This affects their expectations and in turn their achievement. CSAs then may be a powerful tool for equity, 
By giving families savings incentives, CSAs may improve the financial health of low-income families and edu educational outcomes of their children, reducing or even eliminating asset advantages currently held by wealthier families. Critically, these are features missing from our just-in-time debt-dependent system. And the return on investment may be huge. Building expectations of results presents a picture of a postmodern financial aid system where the students uh, in K through 12 educators uh, see school savings may improve student performance prior to college, helping to address long-term challenge of college readiness. Children may be more likely to identify as, identify as college bound and their parents may increase their engagement with schooling and more thoroughly encourage their children's educational progress. Colleges and universities may improve completion rates and recruitment of talented low-income students, increasing their ability to, to deliver a diverse, well-qualified workforce. Banks may receive new customers as more families save and more students build a foundation of economic security. Students may graduate with stronger financial well-being, better positioned to contribute productively to the overall economy. In U.S. policymakers concerned about our ability to compete with other nations, given our anemic higher education performance, may see a financial aid system better equipped to usher students through the college pipeline and into productive roles in the global workforce. In conclusion, building expectations of results provides evidence that asset-based approach to financial aid may be a common sense solution to the student debt and college completion challenges facing our nation. Thank you. got to say, Justin, when you talked about the special welcome to NAF this morning, I thought you meant the air conditioning. I think that we should hold all of our events in D.C. in the middle of July because people are glad to be here before we even say anything um, after they walk in the door. So I'm Melinda Lewis. I'm the policy director of the Assets and Education Initiative. And at AEDI, we're really committed to ensuring that our research has a policy impact and that um, the findings that Rosemary summarized that um, we're looking at from demonstrations and from the theory of institutional facilitation that Willie referenced can be translated into policy terms um, because that's where we can really begin to get at impact. Um, I certainly feel being here at the New America Foundation and having these folks assembled in the room that we have the right team here uh, to ensure that this report um, becomes um, a catalyst for new momentum um, to deliver uh, the kinds of policy structures that can take this work forward. Um, you know, for more than a decade now, as Willie referenced, um, research evidence has begun to suggest that low-income children and families can indeed save and that that asset accumulation can deliver improved educational outcomes. And as that research accumulated, um, we began to see then the kind of hook um, that we use to deliver asset policy traction begin to shift, um, emphasizing not so much assets as the vehicle um, through which families can exit po uh, poverty directly, but really assets as a way that um, we can facilitate educational access, education being um, the most potent tool that we have um, for economic security in today's economy. And as we sit here today with college costs rising, um, student debt spiraling, and educational outcomes largely stagnating, we recognize that we may have a particular political window of opportunity um, through which to propose an alternative to the federal government's primary investment in higher education today, that of student loans. But we know that if we want low-income families to save and to be able to save enough to really alter their children's education trajectories, we're going to need to build some new policy vehicles through which they can do so. Because the primary ways that families build assets today, 401ks, state 529 plans, traditional home mortgages, disproportionately benefit those already economically advantaged, already wealthy fam wealthier families. Um, this is where children's savings accounts can step into the policy breach, so to speak. Um, and this biannual report on the assets and education field can serve as a sort of policy blueprint, um, identifying some of the key features that we believe see CSAs need to have uh, in order to set the United States on the road to greater educational equity and improve the return on our financial aid investments. 
What are some of these key features then? First, every child should be automatically enrolled in a college savings account, a CSA, a children's savings account, um, preferably at birth. Americans are sometimes uh, hesitant um, to adopt one size fits all policy approaches, right? But we see from the research that um, we have better participation and stronger outcomes when families opt out of CSAs rather than opt in. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that every child or every family has to have exactly the same experience in a CSA. Universal participation uh, can still accommodate um, specific outreach to and special incentives for lower income families um, who need some of those modifications to make savings vehicles work for them. Um, in many ways, CSAs can deliver some of the same educational outcome effects through asset accumulation that more more economically advantaged children enjoy through their families, through their parents. In order to get there, though, um, we are going to need to acknowledge the barriers that those families face today to savings and develop program structures that can facilitate their success and help them overcome some of those challenges. Second, ability to accumulate sufficient capital is critical. To maximize savings for low and moderate income families, CSAs should be seeded and contributions should be matched um, with public funds to accelerate asset accumulation and leverage parental expectations and aspirations for their children. This match could be issued in different forms, uh, transferred directly or as a refundable tax credit. And there is precedent here. Several states have implemented some matching components in their state 529 plans, sometimes one-time grants available available to every family who participates, and sometimes um, subsidies that are targeted at lower income savers to really parallel the tax incentives um, that are available to wealthy families through the tax structure. We know from research, as Willie referenced, that children do not need to be able to save enough to finance their entire college education in order to see the educational advantages that come with savings. At the same time, though, if low-income children and their parents cannot realistically expect that their savings effort um, will result in enough asset accumulation to reshape their educational prospects, CSAs will become yet another institution unsupportive of their educational aspirations. Relatively small tweaks in CSA policy then, essentially kind of getting the details right, may make a significant difference here. Establishing children's accounts in their own names, for example, um, can reinforce the higher education goal because research suggests that those dedicated school accounts uh, may have particularly uh, significant educational effects. Low initial deposit requirements get accounts opened, especially for families with very few resources to divert to savings, triggering then some of the uh, attitudinal and behavioral effects um, even before really significant asset accumulation um, can kick in. Savings initiatives should also include financial and college preparatory education to build the total complement of human and financial capital that research tells us correlates to um, greater college achievement. Financial education is widely regarded as a component of financial security, and CSAs provide a unique and powerful tool with which to engage children in making their own financial decisions. In all facets of CSA policy, policy design, best practices should be considered against questions of political feasibility. And certainly New America Foundation has done some of this analysis to figure out um, how we can effectively message um, CSAs and, and how some of those policy components need to be structured. For example, while low-income households need supports to help them accumulate significant assets, um, we know that um, a relatively modest initial government investment, say $500 um, of deposits at birth, can generate broad political support. Um, but much more, uh, much larger initial sums may um, engender greater opposition. Early intervention then will be critical um, in order to give asset balances significant time to grow um, with time and also to let children um, reap the benefits um, in terms of shifting their expectations for college um, as they move throughout their academic careers.
Finally, while the case for CSAs is perhaps most convincing in the realm of improved educational outcomes that can result from student savings, we know that even college graduation is not the ultimate goal of any financial aid system. Instead, Americans value higher education primarily for what it can bring a stronger economic foundation, and the promise of the American dream. Towards this end, CSA should allow withdrawals for pre- and post-college expenses to support human capital investment while students are still in school and to facilitate asset purchases post-graduation. If the savings effects are to be lifelong, then CSA should support savings and asset accumulation from birth to death. Building expectations delivering results describe some current CSA programs that incorporate many of these key features, similarly to what Rosemary mentioned, um, and describe some of the effects that we're seeing from some of those experiments in the field, including states like Maine that provide matching funds within their 529 plans, San Francisco's Kindergarten to College Initiative, administered largely through the school district, the Seed OK demonstration in Oklahoma, as well as international examples that illustrate the broad appeal of encouraging low-income children and families to save their own money in order to achieve their own goals. The report also details policy proposals, such as the Aspire Act, which would create a savings account for every child in the United States capitalized with a $500 deposit at birth, and the American Dream Accounts Act, which would use existing Department of Education dollars to develop online platforms that partner students with entities providing savings accounts and college readiness tools. These examples are offered not to provide definitive answers to the critical questions facing U.S policymakers, considering how assets can complement loans to build a better financial aid system. Collectively, we must still consider questions like whether state 529 plans can be adequately modified in order to meet the savings needs and capabilities of low-income students, um, or how to best use incentives to elicit the savings behavior uh, and educational expectations that we know from research are linked with educational success. CSAs may be viable as a national policy alternative if they can be clearly understood to have potential to solve one of our most pressing problems, how to bring college affordability to enough prepared students to increase educational attainment without compromising future economic success, that of individual students or that of our nation as a whole. Importantly, this policy shift does not require massive allocation of new dollars. For example, New America Foundation research shows that it is possible to fund the Aspire Act for only $3.25 billion for the first year, while the federal cost of student loans is expected to be $36.5 billion in 2013. Taking into account the long-term financial effects of outstanding student loans, if asset-based approaches to higher education financing can reduce dependence on debt-heavy ones, then the net cost may be understood to be even smaller. These various developments, some of which we'll hear about more this morning, rethinking Pell Grants as early commitment programs, developing new structures such as Aspire, modifying 529s to better meet uh, disadvantaged families' needs, should not be considered competing approaches, but instead complementary options for delivering national CSA policy. Getting the parameters right so that CSAs can deliver on the promise of educational outcomes requires understanding understanding the research revealing how assets work to influence students' attitudes and behavior and what features need to be in place to trigger those effects. It will demand coordination with other systems, including elimination of asset tests from public assistance programs, protection of balances from means-tested financial aid eligibility, and appropriate tax incentives to parallel the advantages afforded to wealthier savers. Designed correctly and situated appropriately, children's savings accounts may be our best hope to transform higher education. How it's financed, who can afford to attend, how students envision it as part of their futures, and the effective value of a degree. CSAs work in ways that Americans understand through hard work in school and asset accumulation. 
Perhaps most importantly, in today's political and fiscal climates, they could be largely financed using money already committed to education, but in smarter ways. Building expectations, delivering results reflects our best understanding about what CSA policy needs to look like and how it needs to work in order to realize that potential. Good morning, I'm Rachel Black and I'm with the Asset Building Program here at the New America Foundation and I'll be ushering us through the rest of our conversation this morning. Uh, we've just heard Willie and Melinda make the case for how CSAs could fill a critical gap in existing financial aid options by helping students build both the resources and the expectations necessary for college success. And we've also heard Melinda identify some of the key factors uh, that were important in designing a successful CSA policy. So now the questions before us are, how do we translate this research and some of these recommendations into real life? How would we expect to see a savings account uh, influence the academic trajectory of students, and especially those from low-income backgrounds? Um, how would we see CSAs uh, integrate into the existing set of financial aid options, and what are some of the political considerations that would influence how CSAs are implemented? Thankfully, we have a very distinguished uh, set of panelists to help us uh, answer those questions, who I'll invite now to go ahead and come up uh, on stage. Uh, first, we have Dana Goldstein. Dana is a Bernard Schwartz Fellow here at the New America Foundation, and she's a journalist who's written extensively on issues within the education field, including a piece last year in the Washington Monthly that focused on the relationship between children's savings and academic aspirations. Next is Michael McPherson, who is the president of the Spencer Foundation, and he's also the co-author of a recent report from the College Board, Rethinking Pell Grants, uh, which recommends advancing a portion of Pell into an educational savings account for low-income students. And we'll conclude with Ben Miller, who is with the Education Policy Program here at New America. And Ben has actually just returned to us uh, from a stint at the Department of Education, where, among other things, uh, he contributed to the development of the Children's Savings Account Research Demonstration Pilot within the Gear Up program. Um, after our panelists conclude, uh, we'll open it up to questions from all of you. Um, luckily, you do not have to be in the room with us here to contribute a question if you are following following us on Twitter, you can tweet us your questions at at SSNAF. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dana. Thank you. Um, so I want to tell you about two real life uh, young people who participated in these sorts of programs. And I hope that their stories will, will give us all a sense of how all this does translate into the real world. Um, so the first person I'll tell you about is Marsha, Marsha Jackson. At the time I interviewed her, she was 23 years old. She grew up in public housing on the Lower East Side. She's a twin. She had a single dad who was an alcoholic and was often physically abusive to her and her twin sister during arguments. At the age of 14, there was an explosive fight between her and her dad, and before he could physically confront her, she actually ran from the apartment into the local precinct. Um, the police put her into Child Protective Services, and she spent the rest of her high school career living in residential uh, facilities in Westchester, which took her away from this abusive home, and actually started to get her to think about college. She had always been a pretty good student, especially considering the trouble that she had had at home, and this was recognized by the social workers and counselors who she encountered when she did leave this bad situation. Um, so they helped her get to Gilbert College, which is a small, I think it's a private Catholic school in upstate New York. Um, but she lasted less than two semesters there, and I, I'll explain why. Um, she had won a $4,000 scholarship, but when this money appeared in her the bank account she had at the time, she spent it within a week. She had never at that point had any experience with having money, with spending money, with saving money. And um, to this day, when I interviewed her, she really couldn't explain what happened to that $4,000. She did buy a bunch of electronic sort of items, um, but she couldn't really explain totally what happened to it. Um, she was also the, one of the only black students at this college, and she felt very out of place socially, so that was a bad experience for her. Um, and at this time, she had sort of reconciled with her dad. 
Her dad was dating a woman who worked at Bank of America and would earn bonuses for signing people up for credit cards. Now, she signed Marsha up for a credit card that quickly got her into credit card debt. So she, she just accrued a bunch of financial problems as soon as she graduated high school, and college did not work out for her, and she returned back to New York City. And there she was put in basically free housing for children who were uh, aging out of foster care or aging out of child protective services. Um, and she was meeting with a law guardian who was helping guide her. And at this point, she really did get the help she needed. She was um, she was directed toward one of Mayor Bloomberg's very um, very interesting programs. It's called the Youth Financial Empowerment. And here she was enrolled in a in essentially a matched savings account program that was paired with financial counseling and a lot of social counseling as well. And she um, was put into a savings program that was matched. Um, two to one. So, for example, she saved about $1,000, and this ended up to be about $3,000 for her. She was also given very intensive uh, social counseling. She enrolled at Brooklyn Manhattan Community College, which was much more prepared to deal with a student of her background and to, to guide her. Um, and she got very interested in graphic design. Now, what did she use the money for that she was able to save and get matched? Um, so you, she used it to buy a digital camera, which all the other kids in her program had and she really couldn't have participated in this graphic design associate's degree program without that and also a macbook computer she'd been relying up to that point on sort of donated used old laptops and and as willie was saying the lack of technology can can really you know hurt someone's college aspirations um interestingly her first instinct for what to do with this money was not that as I said, she was living in this apartment building for youth that had aged out of the foster care system. And this was considered a very unattractive, bad place to live. And a lot of the young people that were living in these buildings have the aspiration to save up rent money so that they can leave and they can rent a regular apartment. But her counselors at the Youth um, Financial Empowerment Center said, hey, it's a really bad idea for you right now to be paying rent when you can be living essentially for free, spend this money on your education. Now, without that sort of counseling, she would not have made that choice at age 19. She was very anxious to be independent and had all those same feelings that any young person would have. Um, and so it's really crucial that the counseling aspect of this helped her avoid the mistakes that she had made at her previous um, Gil Gilbert College experience. Um, and she also... Um, she was also helped with getting a paid internship. So the matching account and all this other stuff that was happening to her was very successful for her. And she is um, planning now to transfer to a four-year college and continue her education in graphic design. Uh, the second person I want to talk about is named Rayvon Clark. Um, he is from Washington, D.C. He's the second oldest of six children from a two-parent family in Anacostia. Um, he was a 4.0 student, and in elementary school, his teachers suggested that he apply to attend KIPP charter schools, and he did attend KIPP charter uh, middle schools and high schools here in D.C., and he participates in the KIPP City Partnership that was referenced earlier for college completion. Um, now, his savings account was seeded with $50. What was interesting to me about um, Rayvon is that he only has that $50 in that account. His parents or himself have not been able to add to that. I mean, he's one of six siblings, and they even the $23 per month feels like something to his parents that they cannot, um, they, they don't have, that they don't feel that they can participate in that. Um, but what's interesting to me is that when we spoke, it was clear to me that having the savings account was part of sort of an overall college expectations messaging strategy that have been quite powerful and persuasive for him. Um, and if you're familiar with the KIPP schools, you know just how deep it, it goes in that environment. And, you know, each classroom is the name of a college that the teacher graduated from and all that. Um, and he was also helped uh, through counseling at KIPP to attend a summer program at Georgetown to get him ready academically for college. Um, and what's crucial about his story as well is that he had a lot of help with applications um, for admission to college and also scholarships and financial aid. And because we know that the amount that low-income kids are able to save is actually not enough and is not going to be near enough to actually pay the cost of college, it is very important that the messaging around savings is paired with good information about how financial aid and scholarships can fill those gaps. Um, this is interesting to me because when I was writing this article, 
I talked to some social psychologists in this field who said that children as young as third grade are able to say things like, I won't be able to go to college because it's too expensive. So if an eight-year-old can say that, it's very important that when we start talking to kids about savings, it's, it's matched by the message that that is not the only way. You know, there's a lot of different ways um, that you can go to college in terms of, in terms of paying for it. Um, so yeah, these savings accounts are important, but they must be part of a comprehensive, a comprehensive strategy. And I think for, in the in the two cases with the kids that I talked to, it really was, and that's why it was successful for them. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm next. Is that right? Uh, uh, so I was a member of a, a, a powerhouse panel. Basically, it consisted of higher education leaders, researchers, and me. Uh, who didn't belong in many ways, but uh, uh, we were focused on Pell, the Pell system as a whole, and reforming Pell, and we, our report has a number of brilliant and fascinating ideas that I urge you to check out. And one, one aspect of the report was uh, a proposal for uh, savings accounts for children uh, using the kind of information that's in the Pell Grant to guide who would get the accumulation of the accounts Basically, the idea was that a child reaching a certain age, which might be seven or ten or a number to be decided, uh, would qualify for uh, a savings award based on family income and assets if, those, if that income and assets would have put that family into Pell if the kid were of the right age to go to college. Those would only be usable for, for post-secondary education, and it would cost the government nothing unless the the child did decide to go to post-secondary school. Now, I won't go into the de details of this. I just want to mention three ways that our proposal differs from uh, the CSA proposals we've been hearing. One is our proposal, and I have to make this clear, was proposed as a complement to Pell, which would require additional support. We did not say to divert money from Pell into this program. And if I'm going to be able to eat lunch with the people on that panel, you've got to hear that. We did not say that. It's not crazy to think about doing that, but it's not what we said. Second, our proposal for low-income people does not include any matching component. The proposal that we had says the federal government creates these accounts. They come into play if the person goes to post-secondary education, but there's no match. I'll come back to say, because I think this is really important why we think that. Third, we proposed beginning this as a pilot effort with carefully designed experiments and demonstration programs to illuminate the behavioral effects in, in controlled ways. We know more than we did 10 years ago, and it's great that some states and others have tried programs with some of these features, but our behavioral knowledge and our causal evidence are quite shaky and sketchy on these matters. And a lot of work needs to be done, particularly a lot of work would need to be done before you could say with confidence that this is a better use of money than Pell, which would be what you would be doing if you divert money from Pell to this. Uh, those are important differences, but I want to underscore that the whole panel is very sympathetic to all the basic reasons you all suggested for why thinking about the asset and saving sides makes sense. Now, let me come back to the why no match question. I actually want to use what uh, uh, the first panelist said to explain. Neither of the families she described would have participated in your program, not the alcoholic father and not the, the family with six kids. Right? They have to save $100,000 to meet your design. Or $23 a month times six, right? That wouldn't work. The reality is that it's really hard to save when you're poor. Some people can do it. Maybe a majority of people can do it. Uh, they may be the people who, who manage money better, grew up with better experiences at home, who aren't quite as badly off as some other low-income people, or who have somebody in the wings who is in a position to help them. Maybe a majority of people will do that, but some substantial fraction of parents won't, in fact, save. 
a lot of poor families are in really tough shape in the ways that, that she described. Uh, maybe there are people who just are not good at parenting. Maybe there are people who have harder than average life owing to illness or addiction or some other factor. Either way, none of that is the fault of the kids. Why should Marcia at age 14 not have had any money in a savings account because her father was an alcoholic? We think it's really important to recognize that above some level of income, matches make sense. Below some level of income, those kids just need help. And it's not their fault if they have irresponsible parents. I think, now, I'm speaking more for myself here than for our group, although we were very clear that we didn't want to match for, these, these, for our program. But I think it's really important to say something like, you need to disregard a lot of income up to some level at which you begin to require a match, or you're going to leave the worst off people in this society out of your program. I think that's important to think about. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, you know, it strikes me that when you're talking about sort of the benefits of child savings accounts, you really see two different things. One is sort of the actual accumulative accumulation of assets to help afford college, and the other is this sort of aspirational giving people a sense that college is affordable, they should go. And I think that actually if you were to design accounts to achieve each of those goals, they wouldn't quite look the same. Sort of designing an account designed to get people to accumulate assets versus building aspirations look quite different. And I think if you think about what the government role, either the state or the federal role is here, trying to get a federal role to actually help with the accumulation of the asset side, I think would be very difficult. And I can talk a little bit about our experience with the Gear Up program as to some of the challenges we encountered there. But that I think if your focus is really on the aspirational side and you wanted a strong state role, that sort of creative use of accounts involving a lot of expenditures that states are already doing could actually be very promising. So just really quick in terms of the federal side of things with the, the Gear Up program, you know, there's sort of three main challenges we encountered there. And if you were to sort of expand this broadly, I think they would still apply. Um, cost obviously is an issue. You know, right now um, we were able to sort of take additional money from the Gear Up program that we had there to fund these accounts. But if you wanted to do it at scale, you'd be looking at a fairly sizable additional federal investment. And it's probably hard to find that money at this point in time just because sort of the main federal financing program for college right now is the Pell Grant program. And that's slated to run with fairly substantial budget deficits going into the future. And because of the way it's budgeted, Congress needs to find that money each and every year. So you'd be looking at sort of a zero sum game competition. Um, but the second sort of difficulty we encountered was sort of the infrastructure. Uh, if you think about the Pell Grant program and the way the federal government supports higher ed now, it essentially has 7,500 middlemen in the form of colleges and universities to help them give out the dollars, make sure they're returned if they're not used properly, sort of obey all the different rules around that. So if you wanted to ext extend the savings accounts to the federal level, you'd need to think about either building an infrastructure that would have the federal government dealing with sort of millions of additional kids one-on-one, -on -one, or working with states to set something up, which is achievable, but it would be a lot of additional work. Um, and the third problem that I think was sort of our biggest drawback with the Gear Up program in particular was that basically whenever you use federal dollars, they come with about as many strings as a marionette. Um, we had to set in rules that said that the federal dollars had to be put in a separate account because you had to make sure they weren't commingling with the, the own contributions and being taken out incorrectly. That separate account basically had to be in risk-free assets. So essentially you were getting kind of no interest accumulation from those dollars since T-bills return almost nothing at this point. And then there were a host of other restrictions on what you could pull the money for and how it would work. And you know, when we were dealing with grantees, um, I think they found that very challenging. And we ultimately were unfortunately not able to get anybody to apply for that program. Um, but if you take a step back and you say, you know, what we really want to focus on is the aspirational side, then I think it's worth remembering that states already invest a great deal of money in their own financial aid and their operating subsidies. Unfortunately, they basically waste a good chunk of it in a lot of states because they give it on so-called merit aid, which is sort of going to people who don't need it as much. So if you were to think about maybe modifying what some states are already doing to make their aid look more like an account structure, I think that could be very powerful. 
And I think what you would base this off of is sort of the so-called promise programs that a number of states experiment with. So states like Indiana, what they do is they go to students in middle school and say to them, sign this contract with us. And if you agree to do certain very basic, reasonable things like take a college prep curriculum, maintain a 2.0, so not like some crazy high GPA, uh, apply to colleges, fill out the FAFSA, et cetera, we will give you either all or some of your tuition covered. And so what you're doing is you're sending that message to students at a much younger age that sort of your behavior can build you toward college. But the way those programs tend to work now is they're sort of an all or nothing shot. You either fulfill the, the contract and you get this great benefit or you don't and you've accumulated nothing. So if you were to think about converting that into something that looks more like an account where you say to someone sort of each year that you fulfill the terms of the contract, you gain part of your college shares, so the notion you're accumulating your college education that way. You could even build in sort of benchmarks, like if you pass Algebra 2, which we know is very important for college success, we'll give you additional money, things like that. So you're really tapping into the resources that are already there. And I think that if you did that, you could still have a strong role for the Pell Grant program, which would be right now, basically, if you're getting a Pell Grant, you find out more or less spring semester of your senior year when you fill out the FAFSA. And that's really too late in the game to tell kids to sort of adjust their behavior, realize, you know, if you're very poor, here's $5,600 that could be on the table for you. So what you could do in this structure is if a state was willing to sort of use their own dollars more intelligently, you could say, we'll take advantage of this existing flexibility that's in law but never been used that allows states to determine Pell Awards based upon eighth grade family income. So you could say to a kid, you know, you do it a couple years, build toward college, we already can tell you right now that if you keep on this path, here's your Pell Grant. And so basically by leveraging dollars that are already there, you can build the same expectations without needing to deal with as much of the concerns about cost and how the dollars are invested and things like that, because you can just show them that the money that's already going to be there for you that right now we don't tell you about until we take your income information, run it through a magic formula and spit out a random number actually is there earlier on. So again, I think it's just about thinking about when you're designing these sort of what's the most important role here? Is it really the accumulation of the dollars and the assets or is it sort of the aspirations? Because I think there are resources that could be there to help with certainly the aspiration side. Great, thank you to everyone on the panel for your comments. Um, Willie and Melinda, there was a lot that was just said, so I'm gonna give you first crack on responding to what we just heard. Thank you. I think that one of the things that we need to do in our society in general is, A, think about how we uh, set expectations for low-income individuals, for high-income individuals, and how they differ. For one thing, uh, we spend billions of dollars marketing to children at a very young age, to low-income children as well, as, as high-income children, to buy goods, Right? Families allow their children to make decisions on where they go to eat, whether they go to the movies, right, at very, very young ages. Uh, and we do spend time uh, talking about this in this report. And, and the point of that is, is that if we think that uh, families, even low-income families, have some money to spend on goods that aren't necessarily uh, uh, for education or for other purposes, but they have some extra money, uh, then while it is true that some of the really uh, poor individuals might not have any money. But, but many of the low-income individuals do have money to save. So part of the problem is we think they can't save. We start off from that point of view in the beginning, whether it be through our social policies, in which case we give asset limits and we say you're not allowed to save, or if we just simply come at it with a perspective of, hey, these people can't save. How can they possibly save? Uh, so I think we need to change that mindset and begin to understand that uh, low-income people can save. Can they save enough for college? Does it need to be supported in other kinds of ways? Absolutely. But there's a real benefit from the very beginning, just having them understand, even the story that uh, Dana gave before, that this individual learns on about how to save, how to manage money, right? When we're talking about transforming the financial education system, we're actually talking about changing a mindset. Changing, changing the way that we think about how people finance college. It's no longer I'm going to mortgage my home, but I'm going to find ways to save and build money for that. And not only that, the government's going to participate in this activity. You're not alone. And not only that, companies can participate. Businesses can participate. Local communities can participate. It's not just the child saving on their behalf. We do think that it's extremely important. We spend a whole 
uh, a chapter talking about this as well, that, that, that there is a case in which some families, uh, for whatever reason, can't help this happen. And in, in those cases, we do need to find ways to support, to make this happen, and to understand that that's what it has to be, we think, we think, either in the child's name or something like that. Maybe, maybe it works out and mechanically is not that, but they get the bank statements, they understand it, it's their account, they're able to participate in this thing. And so I think taking some of those things into consideration is important. And, and when we think about the Pell Grant, Pell Grant's one of many different ways in which we're spending money right now. So the question I asked in the beginning, are we spending our money in, 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 in the best way is an important question to ask because it's not only about whether or not a child has access at the point of enrollment, right? It's a, it's, our whole financial aid system is designed so that people can access college, but it's also about how they leave college and it's about them getting to college. And one of the, we think, the benefits to having some savings programs, which is a lot of thought that needs to be done yet. We don't claim to have the absolute model or answer at this point in time on how this will all look. I think there's some great things that everybody's mentioned down here. Maybe states will be involved in financing this. But there's many ways of doing this. And how can we use the existing money in better ways to maximize children's long-term outcomes? We need to start thinking in that way. It's not just about getting a kid into college, but it's what kind of condition there are when they leave college. Do they have lots of debt? Are they going to have to take part of their income later in life, right? How are they then at the same, same position that somebody else who doesn't need student loans, who doesn't need to pay back uh, their college tuition later on in life some way, right? How are they in the same position? It's about equity also. It's about someone leaving with a college degree who has the same effort, the same ability, having the same opportunity then afterwards, and put them in the best position for that as well. It's not just saying we gave them a college education, but also did we give them a college edu education and put them on the same footing as other kids with a college education is also important. So I think there is this big picture. And do we have all the answers? By no means. But do we have something that we think can work and make sense? Uh, yes. And we, now we just need to continue to work at flushing out all the ideas and working together to figure out how that works in real terms with the federal government, with the states, with individuals. And I think there's some work to be done on that yet. Melinda, do you have anything that you want to add to that? Not much. I think just you know what I had written down as I was listening and particularly crystallized for me listening to Ben talk, you know, this is a not insignificant challenge that we face. This idea of how do you know, in some ways we're headed in the wrong direction in terms of a widening college completion gap in particular. As Willie said, it's not just about getting kids in school. And Dana's stories reference this too. Um, you know, we are seeing research that suggests that assets may also shape how students engage in college. You know, essentially how we can turn them into informed consumers of the educational experience when they're there. And we're seeing a widening chasm in college completion rates among more economically advanced, between more economically advantaged and disadvantaged students. And so in order to confront this challenge, we really need to make sure that we are using every possible tool and every policy lever at our disposal. And so while as Willie referenced, and you know, it's on the front page of um, nearly every paper now, we're talking a lot about some of the variables in college financing, where should interest rates be, and you know, what should be the mix of loans and other types of um, um, products. One of the things, one of the elements we're not really fully exploding is that exploiting is that of timing. Um, and that I think was a theme throughout each of the panelist remarks. How can thinking about how students get not just actual financial resources to finance college, but also information uh, and um, assistance in shaping their expectations about college at different points in their academic career? How can we make sure that we're not leaving the variable of timing on the table, so to speak, but really think about what can we learn about how we engage children at young ages in other aspects? of financial decision making and leverage that for reshaping um, their experiences, not just as they are young, but also post-college as we think about how to ensure that a higher education really gets them to where we're trying to go. So again, as, as Willie said, you know, there are obviously unanswered questions about exactly who needs to be engaged and what their contributions might look like. But I think that we really need to kind of fully engage this variable of timing as we think about how we might be able to get more for some of the existing investments that we're making, while of course not denying that there may be um, a need to bring um, some new elements and some new players in as we collectively confront this challenge.
Great, thanks. And let me ask uh, William Melinda just one follow-up question before we open it up to the audience. Um, I think we heard some concern that maybe at best um, the federal en engagement in developing a national CSA policy could uh, maybe at best be uh, well-meaning, but perhaps ineffectual, and at worst, a diversion of critical resources in existing programs, uh, and one that could further concentrate um, the availability of uh, higher ed um, financing resources on the upper end. Can you speak a little bit to maybe some key design features uh, that would be necessary to ensure that uh, lower income students are at an advantage? I would say several things, and part of this comes on, on, on the asset world itself, whoever that is, those people studying the savings accounts and stuff, is, uh, for, for instance, like the Gear Up program. Uh, one is, is that uh, it is new to the education department, to the education field, and for the financial aid field, to be working around CSAs. So, so there's some learning curve there. And so I think that there needs to be uh, adequate timing before you start a program so that you can get people ready with the gear up program. I, I didn't think there was adequate timing and adequate consultation uh, around a lot, much of the things before they even came to kind of the quote unquote experts in the field around CSAs was already in place. Uh, and so I think that if we were, and I think it was well intentioned. I don't think that's, I'm not criticizing them for that. I think it's just uh, not knowing, right? And, and so uh, on how to go about it. And so there needs to be the right people at, at the table in the first place. Secondly, I think if we're talking about uh, whether or not the uh, federal government or states or other people are willing to divert money uh, into the savings arena, well, um, it's not satisfactory to me, being a researcher who knows nothing much in life, but uh, that uh, it simply can say that they don't want to or they don't feel like it's, it's reasonable. The, the, the case is if, if there is a good reason, if we can maximize our dollars and use them more smartly, then we should do that, right? Now, I think there's still an open debate about whether or not this is, is the absolute answer, but it needs to be on the table, and we need to begin to dis discuss it and figure out would – Pell Grant dollars be better used if they were given much earlier. There's a lot of talk about this generally, whether we're talking about with CSAs or otherwise. There's a, there's a growing amount of people talking about, should we start giving some of this money earlier on? Now, whether we join it somehow with a CSA program is another story, but there's a lot of momentum around the idea or a thought around the idea of maybe we should, some people say it should give it in 10th grade, some people say it should be in 5th grade, but there's this discussion as to whether or not some of this money could be diverted and used earlier. Because why? Because we know that if children get access to this money earlier, know that they have a, it's going to change the way they think about college. We have a good sense of that. We have a good, I don't know if we know it 100%, but we have a real good sense of, of that this might be the case. And if it is the case, then we should really think about whether our, I can say this, I'm a researcher, our, our public uh, policy people think it should be or not. We should press it and, and say that maybe this is something we really should be part of the conversation we think about in real ways. Linda, do you have anything to add? Okay, great. Okay, great. Well, we have two microphones. Uh, if you're interested in asking a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you. This is uh, for the benefit of our audience who is watching online. They will not be able to hear you if you do not speak into your microphone. All right. All right, Hannah. Morning. Uh, I'm Bob Hildreth, and I run a savings program for about 600 uh, families in um, Massachusetts called Fuel Education. Um, we have found that uh, providing incentives is a real science, that the seeds and matches <clears throat> cannot just be assumed to work as far as motivating parents. And I wonder how much uh, the panel has uh, has thought or has uh, accessed the uh, world, the, the science of uh, behavioral science of uh, motivating uh, fam low income families. So I think that there is a lot of research yet to be done on how do we specifically uh, engage families to save, to, to increase their savings. Um, uh, there's a lot of work around games and different kinds of things as well to help incentivize and, and help people to save that showed some promise. Um, uh, I can't say there's a particular area of study that I've delved into a lot and that I that this report goes into in great detail. 
Uh, and so I don't think I'll speak a lot on it, but there, there is a lot of research going on by a CSD and others, or a Center for Social Development and others around how to uh, use incentives in ways that uh, can create greater savings. I, I would just note, I mean, I think you're right that this, this is a question that needs a lot of study, and it's, it's very likely, it seems to me, that there is a lot of variation within any of these populations in their proneness to respond to particular kinds of incentives. So just in the way a big article in the New York Times on Sunday said that, that these random control studies of medicines fail to capture all the ways the medicines work differently for different people, I think the same is true of programs like this. There is a lot of research in a closely related area, which is saving for retirement, which is a huge disaster, as we know, in this country. The, uh, we've, we've basically shifted from having employers take care of the behavioral problems of saving to passing them back to the employees as individuals. And that, of course, that so much in our society is moving from institutions helping to provide stuff like college education to expecting people to figure it out for themselves. And uh, I think in the retirement literature, there is a lot of work on these questions about how you frame the alternatives for people in order to produce uh, good decisions about 401ks. Don't make it complicated. Give them a simple default. Don't ask them to do too much. Build it slowly over time. There are a lot of lessons, I think, that could be imported to benefit both sides. Um, in terms of behavioral, looking at behavior, up in New York, the youth uh, financial empowerment program that I talked about is part of Mayor Bloomberg's larger office for economic opportunity. And they have um, a small program that's modeled off Oportunidades, the Mexican program, where parents are paid for positive behavioral um, outcomes, such as taking their kid to the dentist, enrolling their kid in Medicaid, um, having good attendance or good grades in school, and they are given a debit card that has cash on it. And now in that program, they're not requiring that the money gets, get spent in any particular way, but um, when I reported on that in a different article, I found that the families were not generally spending those savings on educational purposes. Um, some of the things that families were spending on were, for example, if they were an immigrant family, a trip back home to their home country to see grandparents. Um, one family, I thought this was very interesting, this was a family with something like eight or nine children, a Somali family. They spent the money on um, like an extra large freezer that they could store um, foods in so that this mom could like go to Costco and buy in bulk and get lower prices for food. So these are... You know, it's hard to say that they shouldn't have spent on these two things that have mm -hmm. um, a lot of, of good outcomes for family, whether, you know, those ties to grandparents, those social, emotional ties, and also um, food, is a ma food is just a major, major concern for these families. I mean, that's why uh, Ravon's family here in Anacastia cannot put $23 in the bank. So um, it's interesting that up in New York there has been experiments um, with all sides of these questions, and there hasn't sort of been one comprehensive um, approach, but there's interesting research coming in. Great, next question. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Andrew Levere, president of CFED. Um, 10 years ago when we uh, ran the first demonstration for children's <coughs> savings accounts, SEED, with many of you in the room, we hired pollsters to figure out what people thought of them. And everybody thought they were a great idea, but nobody knew what problem they were solving. Today, we find they are solving every problem in terms of issues, not just of college completion and expectations, but all issues of financial security. So I just wanted to raise a point about a whole other dimension of what we are seeing with CSAs to get people's reactions, which is the issue of financial inclusion. And this goes to, will poor people save? So one of the most powerful data points we know is that unbanked people, on average, spend $1,000 a year on financial services. Payday lenders, check cashers, rent to own. So as we think about getting these families banked and in mainstream accounts, we then open up other opportunities to generate savings and match 
and access to the kind of financial services and advice that we need. So I'm just very interested in how does this whole financial inclusion piece fit, fit into this? Because actually I think it's going to play at the policy level as important an argument and as many of the arguments that you're making today. So I think it has a huge uh, part of what we're trying to do and we're thinking about. And, and it also ties into the idea of, of thinking about after college, right? So it's the condition that people are in when they leave college. Are they in a financially stable situation? Do they have the financial knowledge to maximize the, the money they're going to make from their education even? Uh, and so I think it, it all ties in for why we should at least give this some, some thought. I wanted to also return back to the conversation on, on behavior. So, so often we, we and I think it has to do with our expectations of the poor and saving in the first place, is we automatically think that they cannot save and do not save. Um, and so a lot of it is giving them access to mainstream banking institutions, because one of the things that Michael Sherrod talked about in Assets for the Poor in the very beginning was this idea that the reason why any of us save for the most part is because we have access to institutional structures that allow us and promote savings in the first place. So now how do we begin, A, once we get past our own mindsets and our own biases about whether the poor can save? Now, can they save enough? is a different story, right? Uh, but building that foundation, giving them all access to the institutions, the structure they need to begin building up ways to uh, save like the rest of us is very important. Then we have to think creatively as a people, do we want everybody in college? And if we do, we understand that just by the fact that they make a lot less money and college is so expensive, they're not going to be able to save $40,000, $50,000 and then we might have to find ways to help them through matches, through incentives, and other ways to help them accumulate more of that savings. But the key for them is that they will be, once they get through college, able to earn more, right? Hopefully through having a college degree, and then having the, be in the financial position, not to be like myself, is $120,000 in debt, right? And have to, to figure out ways to pay that for the next 50 years. But to be in a position where they can have the knowledge and have the, financial ability to move forward, to, to, to really change the, the, the plight of their families' lives. You know, this economic mobility we so much talk about and, and think about, to really see that come to play. Because we, we're not seeing it now. So how do we begin to make that happen so that these children actually can be in a position to leverage college and change their lives, the best position they can be in? It strikes me that you'd see some probably other benefits there as well, because right now, we talk about sort of choosing to go to college, but it's not just choosing to go to college, it's choosing where you go to college. And so the notion that sort of if someone becomes more involved with sort of the larger financial sector, they should hopefully become sort of smarter consumers, understand sort of terms on their loans, terms on their debt, and think about that when they're then picking where they go to college. Because as we see right now, sort of in general, low-income students aren't making particularly smart decisions about where they go to school. So you see people who are academically capable of going to a four-year, who go to a two-year, which has fairly significant ramifications for whether or not they'll ever earn a four-year degree. Or you see them very susceptible to sort of very aggressive marketing that ends them up in sort of low return programs where they take on high amounts of debt, I think largely because they don't understand sort of the product they're taking on because they haven't had much experience with debt. So the extent to which sort of getting more involved in the banking sector prepares them for understanding how to judge returns of programs, I think that would be very helpful for college decision making. Great. And I think there was a question up here. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Jamal of the Alene Reporter with uh, Diverse Issues in Higher, edu higher Education. Uh, two questions. And One. Spencer Feller. Right. How you doing? Right. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, one has to do with uh, restrictions. Uh, you know, families uh, of all income levels from time to time um, have uh, different crises. Um, it could be medical, it could be facing eviction, anything. So what types of restrictions would be placed on uh, a college savings account to kind of uh, mitigate against the temptation to quote unquote, raid the account, you know, to handle this emergency or that emergency. Uh, the second question um, would be, uh, has any thought been given to engaging families around the issue of saving for college during tax time? Uh, there was a, an experiment once, and we have some people that were involved in that in, in the room now, um, where filling out the FAFSA during um, uh, tax time led to, to, to greater enrollment. So I'm wondering if that might be an ideal time to engage families around questions of saving um, because you, you're getting lump sums of money 
um, uh, in a lot of cases, and that might be an ideal time, uh, especially it's like a yearly thing. So even if families don't do savings any other time except, except tax time, if they do that annually at that time, that could be substantial in terms of savings. Jamal, I'll, I'll take number one, and I think Melinda could take number two. Is that good? Sure. Uh, on number one, the restrictions. So typically, when we when we think about CSAs, they've thought about it being restricted. No, you can't access the money until you reach 18 uh, uh, at college and use it for some kind of one of the stated purposes, depending upon the type of CSA we're dealing with. Uh, sometimes it's for home ownership, education, business. So you have to use it for one of these types of purposes. So there's they tend to be really restrictive in that sense. Uh, as we've seen them. Uh, however, I think that uh, there is a need for emergency savings and other types of things. Uh, and we've seen within the research that even liquid assets, assets you can spend readily, have positive effects on children's educational outcomes. So there's, there is reason uh, both empirically and uh, philosophically or, or theoretically to think about why children uh, should be able to access uh, some of that money uh, earlier. So somewhere like Singapore, uh, who has quite the well-developed uh, uh, savings or asset building program has multiple types of accounts for children. One, one account, they can actually access some of that money to do educational growth types of things. So, and another account is purely just for paying for college. And then they have accounts for home ownership and some other things. So they have a, a really a, a multi-tiered system where they have a, a number of accounts they can use to address these issues. Because these are real issues, right? I mean, low-income people do have expenses that come up and they have to find ways to address these issues. I mean, so I think it is real important, and there are ways to, to do the dress and think about that. And in terms of, you know, trying to really capitalize on that particular moment in time at tax preparation, I mean, it really gets to the earlier question about what kinds of incentives and structures will motivate people to save, which, you know, as I think several um, panelists kind of referenced, is not a question that is unique to lower income families, right? This question of how do we get people to make the best financial decisions for themselves and their futures is a question that, you know, confronts all of us in this room and certainly U.S. policymakers on a variety of fronts um, for individuals at all income levels. It's just the lower income families don't have quite as much grace. They, you know, wealthier families can make relatively poor financial decisions and still sometimes rebound from that fairly easily. Um, and lower income families have a much smaller margin of error. Um, but you know, tax time is an opportunity. There have been some um, demonstration programs that have looked at um, tying individual development accounts um, as well as CSAs to tax preparation. New America Foundation is doing some work and has, has done some looking at um, the tax structure um, in general as a vehicle for delivering asset accumulation opportunities to lower income families, not just by linking um, saving to the um, time of tax preparation, but also looking at the role that refundable tax credits might play, um, for example, as a potential role for the federal government in incentivizing the savings of lower income people. I think there's reason to believe, and the report does touch on this to some extent, that um, tax incentives and kind of the um, you know, piggybacking on the tax structure um, as a whole is not an adequate way to deliver um, child savings account opportunities to lower income folks. But it certainly must be a part of the equation, particularly because, as you said, there are reasons to look at every possible way to build on inertia uh, and you know take advantage of the those um, moments that when you know somebody is going to be getting some money, if we can make the diversion to a savings vehicle at that point, all of us benefit from resetting that default um, in ways that are in our long-term advantage. Uh, the, piggybacking your question and, and one of the good points that, that Ben made, uh, the federal government knows a lot about people's financial circumstances. The IRS in particular knows a lot about people's financial circumstances, maybe almost as much as Google knows about their financial <laughs> circumstances. <laughs> and uh, 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 if the IRS leveraged the knowledge they have to provide people with better information about what they could expect in terms of later financial aid, uh, or in the case of the program we proposed, to actually provide people with, you know, a black and white promise that you are going to get this money accumulating at such and such a rate if you're in these circumstances now. Uh, that could help a lot. Gradually, the IRS has been pried loose from its longtime stance of not wanting to share any of this information back to the families who provided it. 
but it's still a very uphill struggle uh, to get their cooperation on these things. And there's, there's already actually precedent for something like that. I mean, every couple of years, the Social Security Administration sends you right. something that right. says, you know, if you were to retire, become permanently disabled here, this is how much you'd, you'd receive in benefits. So clearly, it's, it's something that's capable of being done. And the final thing I would just say on, on taxes is, if you were looking for a pot of federal dollars that is currently spent on education and is not well used, the, the tax benefits would be the immediate place to start because they make filling out the FAFSA look like a walk in the park. They're ill-targeted, they're complicated, and they are a fairly substantial investment. Great, and on that note, I think we need to close out our conversation this morning. I think our panel will remain available if you have any additional questions. So please join me in thanking them this morning. And I would also encourage you to go to savefored.com where you can da download the full uh, copy of the report that we've been talking about. Thank you for coming.